with the Innocence Project here. Uh, Mr. Crone was a former letter carrier who was uh, originally sentenced to death in 1992 for the murder of a Phoenix, Arizona cocktail waitress. Uh, while that sentence was overturned, in 1995, Mr. Crone was convicted again the following year and sentenced, sentenced to life. Both convictions were based largely on circumstantial evidence and the testimony of an expert witness who asserted that bite marks found on the victim matched Mr. Crone's teeth. It was not until 2002 that DNA testing exonerated Mr. Crone and he was finally freed from prison. Mr. Crone became the 100th person in the United States to be exonerated using DNA evidence. Mr. Crone? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron, coming out. I know it might be on your lunch breaks, but how does that happen in our country? Huh? Our legal system, something we pride ourselves in, something we promote as a pillar to, to other countries about how they should to run their countries and their just system. Now that we have these exonerations in our country, and something as horrible as a murder, one of the most adjudicated cases there are, is a capital case, heavily reviewed. I'm going to take the assumption, since we're in a law school, that most of you are going on to become attorneys, become lawyers. Well, some of you might be doing it for the money, some may the prestige, some the power, some maybe out of the goodness of your heart want to help the oppressed and want to see justice done. Whatever the reason that you know that you're doing this for, I want you to realize that everything that you think and believe about some things in life turn out to be a little different. You're going to have to adjust, you're going to have to adapt, you're going to have to change some of your opinions, some of your impressions of some of the things that you have about life. I'm going to tell you about how I changed my impression of the justice system, of the death penalty. i got to start back where I was born and raised. I was from a small town, South Central Pennsylvania. Agricultural town, a rural town. In fact, we were, we were called the Dover Plow Jocks by the other high schools around where I went through, and that wasn't a kind name. I mean, they were making fun of us because we were a lot of farmers. But we were pretty good in sports. When you're born in a small town, you already have a, a reputation, a, a name, so to speak, just by your last name. Your family is already known in that town. And everybody's also helpful. They're courteous. They're there in times of need. They share. They learn good work ethics, good society interaction. All those things I grew up with, and I graduated high school in 74, I went off in the Air Force, served my country. And I got stationed in places like Texas, Mississippi, and Georgia, and Maine. And then I got sent to Phoenix, Arizona. I was 23 years old, man, I liked it out there. Sunny every day, a lot of hot women. I mean, there was all kinds of sports, activities going on. Just a great place to live. People were from everywhere else. They were really outgoing, easy to meet. I got out of the service. I got a job at the post office. Got my own home. Life was good. I had a Corvette, a four-wheel drive truck, a boat, a sand rail, a motorcycle. I mean, I was just living it up. Never met the love of my life. I didn't have any, any exes. I didn't have any children. So all the money that I made was my own to spend. And, and I bought the toys and had fun. and made good friends out there. I had family come to visit me. I know none of you in here will know anything about this, but because I played a lot of sports, I found myself in bars every now and then. They'd sponsor our softball team, our volleyball team, our dart team. And that's where my problems arose. I started playing a beach volleyball team for a league for this one bar, a neighborhood bar. And the owner came into that bar one Sunday morning and opened up and found the front door unlocked. I thought, well, this ain't right. What's going on here? And he made his way in quickly into the cash register. Cash register standing wide open, all the money still in the till, or at least from what he could tell. He's like, what is going on here? He quickly made his way into the office where the safe was. There's the safe. It was closed, but when he pulled on the door, it opened right up. It wasn't even locked. Looks inside for what he could tell. Again, everything seems to be where it's supposed to be. But all this should have been locked up and taken care of. So he starts walking around his bar and restaurant, and he comes into the men's bathroom, and there he finds his night manager, night barmaid. Lying in a puddle of blood, completely naked, stabbed to death, obviously dead. They called the police. And they initiated an investigation on the assumption that this was somebody that knew her. This was somebody that had a problem with her. This wasn't a robbery going bad. There wasn't a break-in. There was no money taken. It wasn't just her being at the wrong place at the wrong time. She was the, the target. And they began questioning her co-workers. People started coming into work. Well, lo and beknownst to me, she had talked to some of her co-workers about having an interest in me. Three hours later, a dog's barking at my house, my dog, and I look out and I see a car parking and two, uni or two uh, suited gentlemen in ties in Phoenix, Arizona in the wintertime, but still it's about 85 degrees. I see them getting out of their car. And I go out to quiet my dog and they come walking across the car uh, driveway there and come walking into my carport. 
He said, are you Ray Crone? I said, yes, I am. How can I help you? They said, do you know Kim and Kona? I said, no, I don't think I know any Kim and Kona. They looked back and forth at each other. I said, you don't know Kim and Kona from the CBS Lounge. I said, wait a minute, I go to CBS Lounge. I said, I'd play darts and, and volleyball there. I said, I know a Kim, but I don't know her last name. They said, you don't know her last name. You're a boyfriend, aren't you? I said, what are you talking about? What's this about? I said, no, I'm not her boyfriend. They said, well, you're dating her, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not dating her. What is going on? What is this about? And that's when he introduced themselves as being homicide detectives for Phoenix Police Department about how she'd been found murdered, and they needed to ask me a few questions. I felt horrible. You know, here's somebody that I knew was actually murdered. I said, sure, come on in my house. They said, no, 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 we need to do this downtown if you don't mind. I actually invited them into my house. I had nothing to hide. But they only wanted to do it downtown, and a black and white police car pulled up, took me downtown, and for the next three hours I was grilled, questioned, harangued about where I was, how long I'd been dating her, how long I'd been seeing her, all this stuff that I told them initially I wasn't and did not and have not ever dated her, never been to my house, we were never boyfriend, girlfriend, I was home in bed, I have a roommate to verify that. During those three hours, at one point, they took my shoes, my sneakers, passed them out to another officer. Another point, they had me take my shirt off, took pictures of my body looking for any type of wounds. Another point, they took fingerprints and mug shots of me. At one point, they even had a, a piece cut out of like a styrofoam coffee cup. It was actually like two of them taped together. Had me bite into that. I didn't know what it was about, but I cooperated. I told them what little I knew, and that was it. I was finally taken home after about three hours. Thought that was the end of it. But it wasn't the end of it. The next day, Monday, went to work that day, delivered my mail. I came home and there was Detective Gregory waiting for me. He said, I, I need to ask you a few more questions just to eliminate you as a su suspect. You want to cooperate, don't you? I said, yeah, what, what do you need? He said, well, I need you to come downtown with me again. A few more questions, if you don't mind. I went downtown with him. As soon as I stepped foot inside that police department, he said, oh, yeah, and by the way, I got a search warrant here. He had a search warrant requesting blood sample, hair sample, and a dental cast to be made. Now, I was a little perturbed about the way he'd done this. Oh, yeah, I got this search warrant. I mean, I would have volunteered. I would have gave it to him anyway. But just the way he was acting now kind of gave me an attitude. And I cooperated when they took blood when they took blood from both arms. I don't know if you didn't realize that it's the same blood or what, but he had to take it about of both arms. And I cooperated when they took hair samples. And they have to pull the hair out by the roots. They don't cut it. They have to actually have the root bulb. And no, they didn't take it all from right here either. They took it from different parts of my body. But I cooperated through that. And then they took me next door and sat me in a room where they had a dentist and he had this big old metal cast tooth shaped thing where they put it full of goop and put it up in my mouth and took two different sets of casts of both the upper and lower. Had me prying my lips open and moving my jaw around up and down and taking pictures and putting plastic utensils in there that I don't think was belonging to people's mouths. But all this stuff I went through for the next two hours. And I was always real sensitive with my teeth ever since I was about 18 years old. I was a passenger in a, in a car, a uh, head-on collision happened, it broke my jaw. Uh, when the jaw healed, I was, my mouth was wired shut for six weeks. When it healed, it didn't heal correctly. They had to actually operate on again, take a piece of bone out, wire it back together, so wire my mouth shut for another six weeks. So I had bridges and crowns and caps and root canals and I don't know what all. And over the 20 or 30 years, they were starting to move and, and get this place and get sensitive and all this stuff. And I really was careful with my teeth. I didn't eat corn in the cob. I didn't bite into apples. And here they were poking around in my mouth, taking these casts. I cooperated through all this. After about two and a half hours of all this stuff, he took me next door, he was done taking the cash, took me next door and sat me down in a little interrogation room, leaned over to me and said, look, it's time to come clean, it's time to tell the truth, I know you're lying, why don't you just confess? Well, I confessed, all right, I confessed, I came up out of my seat, got in his face, told him what I thought of him, what I thought of the investigation, I said, why are you wasting my time, why don't you go find the person that did this? You bring these people in here accusing me, we'll go face to face, we'll go eye to eye, we'll see who's lying. He looked at me and said, look, I'm not going to argue with you, there's other ways to handle this. And he took me home. Now, this is like three hours later now. I'm, I'm pretty fired up after all this stuff. And he just takes me home. He says, there's other ways to handle this. Takes me home. I thought that was the end of it. Next day was a Tuesday. New Year's Eve, December 31st, 1991. Just got home again from delivering my mail, pulling into my driveway, getting out, thinking about what I'm going to do that day. Just getting out of the car. And all of a sudden, I, I hear yelling, freeze, don't move, screeching brakes, door slamming. I look over, it's a van load of police officers unloading on me, all fully suited up, riot gear, guns drawn, black and white, front and back, blocking off my driveway in the road. They got it, they threw me down, handcuffed me, arrested me for murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault, and Kim and Kona's death. Took me off to the Maricopa County Jail, which I believe is the fifth or sixth largest county jail in the U.S. It's right there in Phoenix on New Year's Eve. 
I've never been in jail. I've never been in prison. I don't have friends or family that have ever been in jail or prison. I haven't visited anybody in jail or prison. In fact, I didn't even have detention in high school. I know that might make me sound a little nerdy, a little lame, but I played a lot of sports, man. You don't go tell your wrestling coach you're going to miss wrestling practice tonight because you got detention. You'll be riding the bench and running laps. But there I was in the county jail around a lot of people I knew I wasn't going to like, including the guards. But all I thought about those first couple of days is, man, did I like my car? Who's feeding my dog? Heck, I got a big softball tournament this weekend. They need me. I was naive. I was stupid, folks. I actually was in there sitting and thinking that, hey, they're continuing their investigation. They're going to realize that everything I told them was true, and I'll be out of here any minute. Three weeks went by. Finally got called out to a legal visit. Imagine two phone booths that face each other where the one phone can only talk to the person in the other booth. You look through the glass at that person. Lady comes in, sits a briefcase down, introduces herself as a representative of the public defender's office. Smiles at me real sweet. He says, you've been charged with murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. You can expect to be found guilty, but we'll fight it on appeal. I went crazy. What do you mean I expect to be found guilty? I had nothing to do with it. I was a home in bed. I started ranting and raving. Three weeks I've been waiting to talk to somebody, and this lady tells me I can expect to be found guilty? Well, she got her hand held up. She got me stopped. She said, listen, I'm going to tell you something. She said, I don't take that tone of voice from the judge. I don't take it from the prosecutor, and I'm certainly not going to take it from you. She packed up her little girly briefcase, and she was gone. She left. She got herself dismissed from my case. In fact, she got the whole public defender's office removed from my case. I got a big mouth. Actually, they cited a conflict of interest. They said the next most likely suspect in this murder would be the victim's ex-husband, who was currently being represented by the public defender's office on a child abuse, uh, child assault case, stemming from her daughter having to sleep over with one of her 15-year-old girlfriends, and I guess the dad got involved somehow, and uh, anyway, he was being represented by the public defender's office. So they gave me what was called a court-appointed attorney. Again, I'm stupid, I'm pretty naive about all this stuff. I thought, yeah, right on, I got a private attorney now. I got somebody who can do something here, right on. So this will be taken care of in no time. Well, maybe he's a good attorney, maybe he's a bad attorney. I don't, from my experience, he was a bad attorney. That came on down the road. What I did find out, though, was the courts granted him $5,000 for my defense. For the whole time, for the whole case, he got $5,000 to defend me. You can't even get divorced for $5,000. I got what they paid for. I got to see him about three times and never really hired an investigator. He had an investigator, but she went to see my friends. I had a roommate, like I said, she went to see my friends one time. That was pretty much it. Within six months, I'm sitting in trial. Six months' time, I'm sitting in the county, uh, sitting in the courthouse, facing a capital murder trial in six months. And I found out what that biting that styrofoam was about. I found out what that teeth cast was about. See, they had footprints, they had fingerprints, they had hair, except it didn't really help them with me because it didn't match me. So they hired a bite mark expert, and that's got to be in quotation marks, bite mark expert. A man that said that he conclusively, my teeth were so unique that they absolutely matched this mark on the body that they found in her breast, that 100% fingerprints or, or bite mark evidence was more individualized than fingerprints, and he's absolutely, definitely, positively, beyond reasonable certainty that this matches my teeth, that the bite happened at the time of death, and that made me the murderer. He testified to that effect. We also got records to show that he was paid over $60,000 for his testimony by the prosecutor's office, by the way. Ten times what they paid my attorney to represent me, this man got for one testimony. Of course, it was the key evidence. It was a four-day trial. Three days was the prosecution. Uh, half a day was this man reading off his curriculum vitae, actually. I think it was 17 pages. He was not only uh, dean of the UNLV dental school, he was a uh, had something to do with Northwestern Law School academics. He, had, he was a, uh, some kind of elder in the, in the Mormon church. He was a state senator in Nevada. I mean, he just went on and on and on. A really pompous person. Very impressive, though, to the jury. The fourth day was defense's turn. I raised my right hand, took the oath, got up there and told him what little I knew, how long I'd been going to the bar, how I wasn't her boyfriend, how I was home in bed. Told all that to my attorney. And the prosecutor came up to cross-examine Everything started out. So you deny killing Kim and Kona. So you deny being at the bar. So you deny being her boyfriend. Everything's like, so you deny. I mean, it almost was sounding like, look, why don't you just admit it? You know, you're just, you're just in denial about what you've done. And I'd say something. He said, well, didn't you just say this? Now you're changing. You know the jury's listening to you? All this. I'm, I'm telling you, I was so disoriented after this three-hour cross-examination. When I came down off the witness stand, I almost went over and sat next to him at the prosecutor's bench. I mean, it was that 
just incredible. I mean, I'd, I'd never been through anything like that. And I was 35 years old at the time. And then my roommate, a man that uh, was staying at my house at the time this murder happened, he took the stand, testified before my attorney about what he knew, how I was, I was home in bed. And then here comes the prosecutor up again to cross-examine him. And he stood in front of him for a minute. He said, you know Ray Crow a long time, haven't you? My friend said, yes, that's right, 12 years since we were in the Air Force together. And the prosecutor said, and Ray Crone's always been a good friend to you, always been there in times of need, times of trouble, always looked out for you, helped you out. In fact, he's even given you a place to live, isn't he? My friend said, yes, that's right, that's the way Ray is. And the prosecutor leaned over and said, you'd lie for him, wouldn't you? Turned and walked away and sat down. That was the end of the cross-examination. Basically, here's a man who raised his right hand to tell the truth, a man who served his country like me, Called him a liar, said he's just going to lie to protect his friend, telling the jury to ignore anything this man says. The jury was out for three and a half hours. Came back and found me guilty. Found me guilty of murder and kidnapping. They acquitted me of the sexual assault. Don't ask me to explain that. Good luck in your futures because some things don't fit, but they're still, uh, they ain't always where they acquit, as they say. Prosecutor's whole premise, whole theory, whole motive, he said, was I went there, she refused me sex, I forced myself on her, realized what I'd done and had to kill her to silence her. That's what he said happened. And the jury just acquitted me of sexual assault. Nevertheless, four months later, I'm before the judge. Out in Arizona at that time, Arizona had a different way of doing it. The, the jury was only present for the guilt phase. They only determined guilt or innocence. They were dismissed in the judge. You went before the judge for the sentencing phase. And that's where you have the, uh, the little mini hearing, the little mini trial, the aggravating mitigating. I think most of you know what I'm talking about. Aggravating mitigating hearing is determines whether or not there's aggravating circumstances present. Aggravating circumstances have to be found before you can get the actual death penalty. They used the bite mark in my case for the aggravating factor. Said it either happened just prior to her death. It must have been excruciatingly painful, you know, excessive and, uh, uh, um, uh, pain and violence, uh, helplessness of the victim they used. They also even tried to go on and say that it was a killing to, to, to silence a, a, a witness. Um, or he said it was just after she was already dead. And that's, that's tampering with a dead body. That's heinous and depraved. The judge ruled it, oh yeah, this is definitely, definitely an aggravating factor. And then as most of you know, then it's time for the defense to put on the mitigating. Mitigating means to lessen, to explain away your culpability. Most mitigating factors are drug or alcohol impairment, mental illness, uh, uh, abuse as a child. Think about this a minute. How do you mitigate something you didn't do? How do you show remorse or regret for an act you never committed? That's what they want in the system. They want you to plead for your life. They want you to beg. They want you to show that you've changed, that you so, feel so sorry for what you've done. I had no regret. I had no remorse. I didn't do anything. I told the judge that. He didn't like that answer either. Sometimes I just got to watch what I say, I think. But because I showed no remorse, no regret, I got sentenced to death. I got sent to death row. And after that first month of living in a, a cell the size of most of y'all's bathroom, it was about six by eight, cinder block walls, metal bars in the front, I got fed through a hole about this big whenever they felt like feeding you. Center by, or cement slab for a bed. It had a cushion on it, uh, probably about the thickness of what you're sitting in right now. That was, our, that was our bed. No pillow. We wrapped our shoes up in our towel. That was my new home. And after I got through the initial shock, why am I here? Lord, what did I do to deserve this? How did this happen? I realized that if I'm going to fight the system, I've got to learn the system. I started going to the law library. started reading law books. And as you know, that ain't easy. And if that wasn't hard enough, then I had to start shepherdizing stuff, and then it really got crazy. <laughs> How can one case say right here, be on point, sound like exactly you know, what happened, and say relief is granted, and another case, again on point, and they say no relief granted? Harmless error. And I went through that. And fortunately, three times a week, I also got to get out of my cell, besides going to the law library. See, we were allowed back three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They come to your cell, they look in the little trap, they make you strip, tell you to strip down, you pass all your clothes out through that trap while guards watching you turn around, spin around, lift your feet, pull back your hair, do everything else, so almost like a contortionist, so they can make sure you weren't hiding anything anywhere on your body. And you get dressed in front of them, you put your hands out through that trap. They put a pair of handcuffs on you that had a belt attached. You turn around, that belt will be fastened at your waist. So now your hands are right here at your waist. 
Then the guard would motion for another officer that's outside the pod to open the door. And you'd walk out, the door would slide open, you'd walk out, you'd take one step, and you'd turn away from that officer and you would freeze. Because if you did any other type of movement, it was considered an attempted escape or a threat on staff, assault on staff, and they would take you down. And believe me, with your hands right here at your waist, there's not much you can do. And when they take you down, the first thing that's going to hit somewhere is your head, because they make sure that they plan that that way. And you freeze there while he pats you down to make sure you didn't secret anything away in the 30 seconds that you were getting dressed in front of him. And then they put an 18-inch chain on your ankles. And then they say, dead man walking, and you can start walking now, never to pass another inmate. They don't let inmates, you know, pass in the hallways. And they take you outside and put you in a, a 10 by 10 by 10 square hurricane fenced in area, kind of like what some people would put their bird dogs in to keep outside. That was your rec area. You had a basketball hoop in there, a basketball that some may or may not have air in it. And you spent two hours out there. And it was heaven, folks. Man, it was great. Because I got out of my cell, I got to see outside of a little six by eight area. Got to look off in the distance, see what freedom was about. Maybe hear a car here and there. Maybe hear a dog bark. Maybe see a bird fly. See some other inmates around that I could talk to through the fence. And I have to say, God blessed my worthless attorney. He actually had a good day in court. As I went through this life in prison, going to recreation and going to the law library, I even got a job at the law library. They, they see me up there so much, they said, we might as well start paying you while you're up here. I started helping other inmates, became a legal assistant, legal rep, started helping them in disciplinary issues, started helping them in their own appeals. Well, I'm waiting for my case to make its way through the Arizona Supreme Court. And as I said, God bless my worthless attorney. He had a good day in court. It was a day before trial. It was a Friday. Court. Trial started on Monday. Friday, the prosecutor introduced a videotape made by their bite mark expert. Real impressive videotape with all the smoke and mirrors and lights and camera action of how he matched my teeth, the, the impression of my teeth, to this, this mark on the body. Really, really fancy job. My attorney was awake. He was actually paying attention. He objected to the introduction of that evidence. You know, you have, you know as, a right, as a defendant, you have a right to, a, on a, in a timely manner, to know what evidence is going to be used against you so you can prepare your defense. Here it was the day before trial. They're bringing in this videotape. My attorney objected. Judge says, well, he said, I'm going to allow that video in. He said, you got next week. You can go talk to this witness. You can, you can you know, get it straightened out with him. My attorney said, Your Honor, we start trial Monday. He said, I'm not going to have any time to review this with the witness. He said, I've got to go over the day's notes. He said, I've got to prepare the next day's questions. I've got to review the, the testimony. He said, I won't have any time. The judge says, nevertheless, you make time. I'm going to allow this in. And then a burst of brilliance, probably never again repeated in my attorney's career. He went on to say, well, Your Honor, in light of that ruling, he said, I'm going to need to ask for a 30-day continuance. The judge looked at him and says, 30-day continuance. He said, we need to get this trial rolling. He said, denied. The judge was consistent. He never ruled in our favor or anything. He said he needed to get this trial rolling. Six months after my arrest, he's got to get a capital murder trial rolling. Well, when the Arizona Supreme Court reviewed this issue, they recognized it for what it was. It was a violation of the rules of discovery. I believe it's Rule 15 in Arizona. Well, it might be the same in federal or here, but it was a violation of the rules of discovery. As a lot of you soon-to-be attorneys know, just because there's a violation of rules and fraction, a mistake, if you will, doesn't mean you get a new trial. doesn't mean a person walks free. This, this supposed that all he got out in a technicality it makes it sound like, oh, they misspelled his name and he walked. It don't happen. A lot of ignorant people out there, you need to educate about that, by the way. It just don't happen because, see, there's a second part of it, which is called harmless error evaluation. Just because there's a mistake, just because there's an error, a, a bad instruction, a bad ruling by the judge, they then, rule, they then review it and determine whether or not this mistake, this error, would have affected the verdict. Would it have changed? Well, when they reviewed my case for whether or not it was harmless error, the exact words from the Arizona Supreme Court were, Without this videotape, there wasn't even a jury submissible case against Mr. Crone. They said, without this video, this bite mark evidence, there was no other evidence against me. And they overturned the conviction. They said it was, wasn't harmless error. And so I was ordered back to trial. I got off a of death row. And my family and friends had stuck by me. That's one of the wonderful things of why it was hard to survive in there. I got got the total support of my family and friends that believed in me. Uh, I mean, I told them one time that I didn't do it. I'd have to keep reminding them. I'd have to keep encouraging them. My folks, my close friends all, all believed me and stood by me. And now here it was, it's time for a new trial. But we knew we couldn't go with one of the court-appointed attorneys again. Somebody didn't do anything. My family cashed in their retirements, 
more Easter homes. I had a high school uh, group at my reunion in 94, had a 50-50 drawing where they, they, you paid $10 and, and, and a ticket was drawn and whoever you know, won that ticket, had that ticket, got half the, the money that was, was taken in on the ticket sales. They did it three times. Every person that won, when he was asked, you know, come up, said, I don't want the money, you give it to Ray's family. They gave over $1,200 to my family. Churches had me in the prayer bulletin, take us donations, food. But we ended up hiring an attorney out of California, Southern California, a guy named Chris Plord. We couldn't come nowhere near the $100,000 it takes to hire somebody in a death penalty case. But he'd been familiar with my case. He knew some of the bite mark experts that had been looking into my case. He said, let me take this. $25,000 down he wanted. And he really got involved in it. He was, very, he was experienced in DNA. Found three other bites, started taking my teeth to bite mark experts who all right away said, that's not a match, it's ridiculous. That trial started in February 1996. Lasted six and a half weeks. Over 500 exhibits were introduced. Over 30 experts testified, including three bite mark experts for our side alone. My family came out from Pennsylvania. Newspapers were there reporting. They court TV wanted to film it until they found out how long it might be. They weren't sure if they wanted to keep doing it then. And we felt good each and every day. My attorney had done his homework. He'd done his background check. He went and had done scientific. He'd found that there was DNA tests done on hair that they initially said was microscopically indistinguishable for me and said that it was my hair. And we found out the prosecution had sent this hair off to a, to a lab in Colorado and proved it wasn't my hair. They also found hairs that weren't even ethnically the same as me. There's three different types of hair shafts, uh, cross sections of the hairs. They found hairs that weren't nowhere near could possibly be uh, Caucasian. All this stuff he dug up, fingerprints, footprints that were found in the bathroom or in the kitchen where the knife was taken from, and then around the body that the police claimed, well, no, these footprints had nothing to do with it. The footprints were made in the kitchen because the guy that was cleaning the, this floor that night. And yet then we get pictures well, after we had to pay $1,200 to the police department to get pictures that as a defendant you should have a right to. They charge us for copying fees to make pictures of all, or make copies of the pictures they made. They charge us $700 for, for copies of the police reports. Stuff that as a defendant you should have a right to. They did it because they knew my family was doing it. They, because it was trying to milk us out of our money to try to run us broke so we couldn't defend ourselves. That's what they did. And the trial went good. My family was there, as I said, sitting behind me. And each and every day we felt good. The truth was coming out. How witnesses, people were, were, were dropped from the witness list. Somebody that was, was getting ready to go to work in the morning, a construction job early in the morning, seeing an American Indian, and he testified an American Indian, gave a description, hanging around the bar for about an hour and a half at the back doors. Another person was cleaning the sidewalks in the shopping center, gave a similar description of the same person. And I never realized how much of a win-at-all-cost game it is for a prosecutor. This is how they get their advancement, their career advancement, how they climb the ladder, how they look better than the other prosecutors in the office by the number of death penalty cases they get convictions on, by the conviction record, period. This is a win at all costs. I'll tell you a perfect example. I'll tell you two examples. First one is an example of lying. Somebody you have faith in, a police officer, supposed to tell the truth, raise his hand. That officer got on the stand before the, before the prosecutor. Said, he said, now when you went to Mr. Crone's house and informed him of Kim and Kona's murder, did he say or do anything that made you suspicious, that made you... Concerned, surprised, the detective said, well, yes, right away, Crone denied associating with her. Now, I told you what exactly happened. They accused me of being a boyfriend. They accused me of being her, dating her before they even introduced themselves. He sat there before the jury and said, as soon as he told me of her murder, Crone right away denied associating with her, tried to distance himself from her. He was like he had something to hide. This is what he testified to before a jury. I'll tell you even a more outrageous statement that was made. It's by the prosecutor closing arguments. This bite mark that I'm supposed to make was on her left breast, as I said. They did a rape kit, like you've seen in OJ, where they, where they took the, 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 uh, the swabs and, and, and got actually an Amelie's 2. For some of you don't know what that is, Amelie's 2 is a saliva sample. They know it was the saliva sample that they got. There was DNA involved in that sample. They had tested that DNA. It did not match me. No way, no how did saliva from the bite mark that I'm supposed to make match me. That came out at trial before the jury. And the prosecutor was really sweating that one. Closing arguments come. He stands before the jury in the course of two and a half hours. And at one point he says, now listen, that DNA that they found, don't let them mislead you. That's all the defense has been trying to do. We know who committed this horrible murder. He's sitting right over there, and you have a duty to see that his justice is done. He said, that DNA that was found on her, he said, that's easy to explain. Easy to explain. She's a waitress. She handles glasses and bottles all day long. That was just transferred there by accident. 
That's what he told the jury, that she handled somebody else's glass and ball and, and rubbed herself and it had nothing to do with the murder. The jury was out for three and a half days. Came back and found me guilty again. Now as bad as it felt at that time when I got found guilty the first time and got sentenced to death, it was nowhere near the gut-wrenching, you know, stop the presses, rewind, replay this. What did they just say? Guilty? Are you crazy? I could not believe it because, again, I still had faith in the system, belief that when the truth came out, reasonable doubt would rule, and that jury would see that something ain't right here. And they just said guilty. And I hear my mom and sister wailing in the background, just weeping out loud, and I look around, see them all, all my friends out there cuddling each other. And I look over the jury, and half of them are wiping tears out of their eyes. And I look up at the judge, and he's still trying to read stuff, and he's slurring his, slurring his words and stuff like he's mumbling, and he can't already read. And my big bull of attorneys hanging on my shoulder saying, it's not over yet, I'm with you till the end, this isn't the end. And then I look over to the prosecution side, and they're jumping up and down like he just won the World Series. So this ain't real, this can't be, this just, this just ain't happening. But it was, and it did, and again, five months later, and before the judge for sentencing, again, it's the same story. They used the bite mark evidence for aggravating. I told my attorney I had nothing to mitigate. He said, you let me handle this. And this is the difference with a good attorney. He spent the next three hours going over all the evidence that pointed to someone else. Why those footprints in the kitchen and in the bathroom didn't match me. Why fingerprints where the knife was taken from in the kitchen, used in the bathroom where it was wiped clean in the sink and on the paper towel. Fingerprints that were found on the paper towel dispenser, on the sink, did not match me. DNA, hair, all these other testimony. Why none of this stuff pointed to me? And he went over that for the next three hours. And when it was done, the judge ruled that there was lingering and residual doubt of my guilt. He ruled that it was a mitigating factor that outweighed the aggravating factor. And he sentenced me to 25 to life for the murder. Whoopee, I wasn't going back to death row, yes. Wasn't quite that generous. He sentenced me to 25 to life for the murder. Went on to aggravate the kidnapping. Sentenced me to 21 more for the kidnapping. Ran them consecutive, so I was looking at 46 years before I could have any possibility of parole. I was 35 when this happened. Added up. I'd have been 81 years old minimum before I had any chance of being released. Yes, I wasn't going back to death row, but this was a death sentence. You ain't going to live to be 81 in prison, I can guarantee you. I had a broken arm. It took them three days to decide whether or not to x-ray me. I had kidney stones. They told me it was gas. I had a toothache. They said, all, all we do is pull it, but first you've got to sign a waiver in case we break your jaw. That's the kind of medical attention you get in prison. And then you hear people have the nerve to say, well, you know, I might as well go to commit a crime and go to prison. I get three hot meals a day, a warm bed, and medical, free medical. I'd love to see them spend one day in prison, just one day. They'll be down on their knees. But that's what, uh, what I was facing. It was a death sentence. I was not going to walk out of prison alive. And an unfortunate side effect when you have a good attorney, well, besides the cost, but when you have a good attorney is if he does everything right and really protects your rights, you have nothing to appeal. So now when I'm going through my appeal process, it was getting denied. We didn't have any good grounds to appeal. And I'm seeing people be released on DNA now, seeing it on television, seeing it on, you know, reading it in the magazines and newspapers, thinking, yeah, a lot of good DNA did me. And it was kind of like a, a mixed world. First off, I think about seeing somebody get released and proven innocent. I say, that could be me one day. Yes. And then also see them get released because of DNA and say, yeah, a lot of good DNA does me. And so I went through that. Now I got eight or nine years in, in prison thinking, yeah, I guess I'm going to die in here. My family and friends are still sticking by me, writing me, encouraging me. My attorney's still helping me. Arizona was one of the first states to pass a new legislation for access to DNA testing for inmates to make it easier for them to get testing done. My attorneys jumped on it, 2001. They went before a judge. Check this out. The victim's pants and underwear had never been tested. In a rape case, a murder case, the pants and underwear of a person found naked was never tested. We got a hole of that. You could see an obvious blood spot the size of a dime inside of her pants. There also looked to be some biological evidence on her, on her underwear. Thank God the police had saved it. We petitioned the courts to test this, to get it tested. Over the objection of the prosecution, over the objection of the Attorney General's office. They said it's a wild goose chase and waste the court's time and money. You know, he's been convicted twice, a jury of his peers, overwhelming evidence. Don't do it, Your Honor. Nevertheless, the judge ordered it done. He ordered the Phoenix Police Department's recently accredited DNA lab to do it. Now, uh, after what you heard me telling you, the last people in the world I want to touch anything in my case with the Phoenix Police Department. But it turned out to be a blessing. You see, law enforcement agencies are the only people that have access to the DNA data bank, the nationwide DNA data storage area where they keep the DNA of people convicted of murder and sexual offenses from all over the U.S. 
And when this lab technician extracted the DNA from her clothing, compared it to me, compared it to her, it was neither of us, which was all the courts required, on his own, he said, well, I wonder what will happen if I plug this into the data bank. He put it in the data bank. It came back with a match. Came back with a match to a man that, that at that very moment was serving a 10-year sentence for having sexually assaulted a child three weeks after the murder. A 15-year-old kid he assaulted, which is why his DNA was in the data bank. A man that was on parole at the time of the murder for attempted sexual assault four years earlier. A man who was American Indian, which was consistent with some of the DNA, the hair analysis that we had. And a man whose parole address was his mom's house, 500 feet from the bar. We got this man's name. My investigator went to see him down in, in the sexual offenders yard at the Department of Correction in Arizona. First he denied everything. Then he admitted, well, he said he was in a drunken blackout. He don't remember exactly what happened. He remembered how he got in an argument over the bathroom with the, with the barmaid. He, he went on to say how he woke up. remember waking up with blood on his hands, wondering, oh, my God, what did I do? Did I do that, you know, from seeing it on the news? My investigator had tape recorded this. So now with the tape recording, the DNA results, he went to the prosecutor's office, him and my attorney. said, let Ray Crone go. He's innocent. Here's the proof. You know what that prosecutor said? He ain't innocent. We know he did it. We got the bite mark evidence. He didn't want to hear it. Was not interested whatsoever. But somebody was interested. A reporter from the Arizona Republic. As I said, Phoenix is about the fifth or sixth largest city in the U.S. Got a lot of readership there and only one newspaper. She came and interviewed me, my attorneys, and wrote a front page headlines about how recent DNA testing cleared a man that was serving a life sentence who at one time had been on death row and now pointed to a man that had a, a, a long record of sexual offenses and how I, Ray Crone, was still serving 25 to life for this murder. I got a call the next day over the counselor's office. I'm in Yuma, Arizona. That's a hot place down there. I got a call over the counselor's office. He said, it's your attorney on the phone. Alan Simpson out of Phoenix is on there. He said, Ray, how you doing today? I said, fine, just another day in paradise. He kind of laughed. He said, well, what are you hungry for? I said, what are you talking about? I'll eat whatever's in the chow hall. He goes, no, no, really, what are you hungry for? He said, what do you want? What do you want? Mexican food, cerveza. I know you kids don't know anything about that. That's beer. He said, cerveza, margaritas. He said, what would you like? I said, Alan, what the devil are you talking about? He said, I just got off the phone with the prosecutor. They just got back from the judge's chambers. He said, they're cutting the paperwork today. You're going home. Four hours later, I walked out of prison. I, I stood there and shook when he said, I said, what? He said, roll up, you're going home. Roll up was a prison term to get your stuff together and get out of here. He said, roll up, you're going home. Four hours later, I walked out of that gate, folks. After 10 years, three months, and eight days of being in prison for something I didn't do, I was free, free to start my life over again, a 45-year-old man, unite with my family. And I walked out also out of the prison gates, looking back, making sure that this is for real, because I didn't trust them. And I certainly don't trust the system this day. I didn't believe I was really going to be free. I thought they were up to something again. But I got outside there, and there was the media and the cameras waiting for me, because I walked out with the distinction of being identified as the 100th person in America to have faced the death sentence, only later on to be freed. A lot of groups have been fighting against death penalty. A lot of groups have been working to expose the injustice of what can happen in our system. We're waiting for that mouse to 100 is a significant number. Not 99, not 101, but 100 is a significant number. And so I was asked to give interviews. I was asked to talk about my experience. I was actually able to talk about some of it. And I remember a lot of would ask me how I got through it. And I, I remember talking about you know, the, the support that I had from my family and friends, but also how I have found support in the Bible. Stories of Job and Jonah, uh, passages in the Bible, how the darkness shall come to light, and rejoice in trials and tribulations, for you shall find favor in the sight of the Lord. And I slept with this under my bed at night, under my pillow for those years I was in there on death row and in, in regular prison population. And one of the reporters in the back raised his hand. He said, well, Mr. Crone, given your faith in God, he said, how do you justify him leaving you in prison for 10 years? I was, like, I, I was, I was dumbfounded. I was, how do I justify God leaving me in prison for 10 years? I mean, how do you answer a deep soul-searching question like that? I didn't know what to say. I just froze there, and the cameras, the lights are all leaning forward. And then all of a sudden, something came to me. I said, you know, maybe it's not about those 10 years I spent in prison. Maybe it's about what I have to do the next 10 years. And that's why I'm here, folks. That's what I do now. I recognized afterwards that those 10 years would be for naught. Those 10 years would be purposeless, pointless, and just downright aggravating and frustrating if it was for nothing. I know what happened to me, and I'm telling you this. If they can do it to me, they can do it to anyone in this country. Anyone. 
I still support the police. I still support, support prosecution. Although most of those people should be in prison. Absolutely. But you know what? The problem is they're not held accountable and liable for when they do bad acts. Prosecutors are totally immune. Police have general immunity. Sometimes power will corrupt. It'll go to your head. And if there's no, nowhere that you're held accountable for, no liability issues, how far do you keep going? I'm here to talk to you today. Some of you are going to be future attorneys. Some of you are going to be future prosecutors. Some of you are going to be DAs and battle it out in court. But you have your morals. You have your values. You have your hopes, your expectations right now that you believe in. I will tell you, you keep those morals, those values, those expectations close to your heart, under your pillow, if you will. And you remember them because when the days come that you're asked to change your values, change your morals, to become somebody else, to keep in your profession, I hope, I pray, that you'll change profession before you change your values. You don't let it change you, you change it. And then that way you'll be helping me and you'll be helping a lot of other people in this world because you know what? When I was sitting there in prison, feeling helpless, I never lost hope because I had family and I'm, my second trial I had an attorney that bleed to me. You're a lifeline, you're a protector of our justice of an American way. Don't ever take that for granted. Don't ever use it to your own power, corruption, and greed. Use it to help others and you'll sleep good every, each and every night. And I thank you and encourage you and wish you well in your future careers, and good luck to you. I work with Sister Brejean's group, the moratorium campaign. We got an offshoot called the Witness to Innocence which is where we're getting other exonerees together, have like a clearinghouse for exonerees that, that want to speak and tell their story, a place where groups that have events like this can, can come to us and say, okay, we got this speaker available, we got this. And uh, in order, whenever you get something started, everybody wants to have paperwork done and do like polls and stuff to find out what we need, and this would help us in, in getting our uh, event off the, off the ground and be more prepared and more receptive to the, to the, the audience's needs, and in this case, law students, because I don't always speak to law students. <laughs> Yes. Did, did you ever have any interaction with, uh, with the woman who was murdered with her family? Did they confront you in, in court and do they kind of, uh, I don't even know where to kind of take this question, other, other than are, are they believe in your innocence now and is that, is that important to you? And did everybody hear the question? Mm -hmm. no. Well, as you know, at that, that trial's at the sentencing phase, the victim's families have a right to testify to make a victim impact statement. Oh, she hated me. She denounced me. Kill him. Look what he's done to my beautiful daughter. He's a monster. He don't deserve to live. Twice she did that before a judge. Imagine that day how you would feel that when you find out that that hate, that anger, was at the wrong person. And see, I not only got out because DNA exonerated, but I mean, cleared me, but I got out because the DNA identified somebody else. I'm not getting out. Some people get out without, there's no other uh, identifiable, you know, uh, 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 culprit. There's no other identifiable uh, uh, person to blame for the crime. I got out because we identified who did it. He does have a record. By the way, he has not been convicted. He hasn't gone to trial yet after three and a half years. Took them 11 months to arrest, convicted, and sentenced me, and sent me on death row. And here it is three years later because he knows the system. He knows how to play it. But when I got out released that day that I walked out and I told you about, I was actually not free to go. I had to wait three weeks to have a hearing before the judge, at which point he, ru he ruled on our post-conviction relief, ordering a new trial, and then the prosecution stepped forward, the attorney general stepped forward and dropped charges with prejudice. I was then and only then legally free to go. During that three weeks, I was ordered not to have any contact with the victim's family or anybody that could be a potential witness in the next trial because they could have and brought me back for trial. I could have faced another trial. Well, she was there at that hearing, that final day when it was released, and when it was over, I walked over to her, and she was crying profusely, saying how she, and this is an old, frail woman, a 70-year-old woman, probably, a, you know, about five foot two, all of maybe uh, 95 pounds, crying and wanting to apologize. I left her talk, and when it was done, I accepted, I said, I accept your apology, but there's really no need. I understand your anger, your frustration at the loss of your loved one. I said, but I said, now, if, you, if I can, I said, I'd like to express my condolences to you. I said, I knew Kim as a friend as from the bar. I said, but I never had a chance to, to commiserate her death or because I was being charged with the murder. I said, so I want to offer you my condolences now, me and my family's condolences for what you had to go through all these years. 
and also told her, I said, and I promise you this, at this man, time the right man will go to prison or, or be, be on trial, I said, because all the power of my, my family, my attorneys are going to see that this time, if there is such a thing as justice, it'll be done. And she cried in my arms and, and again apologized. But I mean, I just felt so bad. Of all the things that I, I mean, all the horrors I've seen in prison, the stabbings, the beatings, the police, you know, prosecution, I mean, all the stuff that I've seen, people being hurt, this is one of the things that hurt me the most was this poor woman. And not, not only did she lose her daughter, but then for 10 years she was living in this, this, this dungeon, this cave of anger, and, and directed at me, and then to find out that all it was wrong. I mean, what a waste of 10 more years, another victim from this, from this, this act. Uh, I've also had some of her, Kim had two, uh, two younger children, or I believe three younger actually, I think one was a stepchild. Two of them had contacted me expressing their um, support for me and, and apologies to me, and I guess it tore the family up. Some believed I had done it, others believed I didn't do it, and I guess the family's pretty much estranged now from, you know, some still might want to think that I did it. Because see, again, this is one of the aggravating things, the prosecution is going to use the victim's family in some ways almost abuse the victim's family, keep them victimized because he never knows when he has to parade them before another jury, another judge, or even a parole board. And keeping that anger, that emotion in, in, the, in the victim's family is alive actually helps when he takes that back to a judge or a jury. He wants to see the anger. When you see people on, on television after horrible murders, horrible as it is, it's the emotion that, that, that moves people for, you know, to, to be angry, to be outraged, to side with the police and the prosecution. And so these people were, for those 10 years, were told everything's going to be fine now. You know, as soon as we execute this guy, and that's why you, they, you hear them, they say, send him to death row. Why they seek the death penalty? Because it's for the family. It's for justice for the family. And they're telling them that everything's going to be fine when this person's executed. And then to find out later on it's not the right person, what that family had to live through, the turmoil, all this stuff, all these promises that were false promises. It's a mess. And this is one of the things, again, that the death penalty does that people don't even think about. If you think that killing somebody that killed your loved one is going to solve your problems and bring back your loved one and take away all your anger, then support the death penalty. I hope most people who are more rational realize that it don't bring anybody back. It just keeps promoting that cycle of violence. And here was a poor family now that had, had to lose a loved one and go through all this. And finally, after 10 or 15 years, realize that, man, what were we thinking? What, what did we do to ourselves? What did we let them do? And this poor lady said, you deserve to be a millionaire after what you and your family have been through. She said, I just believed what they told me. That was, her, that was her last word. She just believed what she told me, what they told her. Anybody else? Oh, by the way, if you all don't already know, I get kind of wordy and verbose at some things. Yes? I'm interested in, uh, did you have any strong opinions about the death penalty before all this happened? I had not really a strong opinion other than that I supported it and figured it was a logical conclusion to our justice system. When all else fails, yeah, kill them. What the heck? I had no concern about it, really, because, I, like I say, I wasn't involved in the justice system. But I figured there was a, a reason for this. This was the worst of the worst. Well, then I get to prison and find out that they're making a deal with the guy that pulled the trigger, the guy that stood there and already had a record of Mao Long, making a deal with him to testify against somebody they have no evidence against and seeking a death penalty against the other guy. I got him on people on death row for conspiring to commit a conspiracy. Because the guy that killed his wife said that, oh, he paid me to do it. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. 17, 18 year old kids are supposedly signed to confessions, and I'm in there helping them read letters to, write letters to their mom and read the letters back. And he signed a confession. I mean, it's, I, I've seen the people in there. I'm, I was sitting there with people on death row, and I know it's like that, that proverbial, it's the only the worst of the worst, it's the monsters. And go hear a debate from a prosecutor sometime. He's going to say, it's, oh, we only see the death penalty, the worst of the worst. Well, my state in Philadelphia, 78% of the people on death row is from Philadelphia. About 85% of those people from Philadelphia are people of color. It's very racist the way it works out. Of course, they'll deny that. They, they have other ways to state the stats. But you know what? The death penalty is just a matter of what, what geography, what area you are. When some counties can afford to seek the death penalty. Some places can. Out in Arizona, the small rural counties, they don't seek the death penalty because it's very expensive to run a capital murder case. Just the jury selection alone is expensive. So, uh, yeah, all this stuff that, that I had a vague... I mean, I might have had an opinion of Mal why, but it was only an inch deep about the death penalty, about our justice system. I didn't see any depth to it. I didn't know anything. Now I had to go inside, go underneath, and learn a lot of stuff that I really wish I didn't know about, but I do, and I got to teach other people, including my family and friends, and now learn stuff that they wouldn't never believe. I mean, even something as simple as people say, well, well you picked your own jury. It's your fault. You don't pick your own jury. You pick who you don't want, and you get stuck with whatever's left. But people actually have the nerve to say, well, you picked your own jury. Well, where'd you go wrong? These are misconceptions that people, I mean, I would have been the same ignorant person before because I, 
What do I care about? And a lot of times when I talk to people that aren't law students that aren't already going through it, but other just regular college kids, I tell them, someone has the power to take away your freedom, your life, you better know something about it. You better learn about it. And that's your justice system. They can come any day and take away your freedom, your life. You better know a little bit about it. And that, that uh, saying about you you have a right to remain silent, man. I was talking with Barry Sheck and Peter Newfield one day about you know, what that means, about what happened in my case. They said, well, you know you have the right to remain silent. I said, yeah, but I didn't do anything. What, what did I have to hide? He said, well, it doesn't matter. He said, once you start talking, he said, all your other rights are pretty much a moot point after that. And all they were saying is, once you open your mouth and you say something, you're cooperating with them as it's going to be written down and used in light most favorable to them, not to you. And your only exception is if you can get them to record it and see if they ever want to tape record it when they're, when they're questioning a person. See if they really want to tape record that until they already got out of you what they want and they say, okay, now let's record this, let's go back over this. Then they'll tape record it. After they threatened you, you know, coaxed you, told you stuff, then they'll want to tape record it. They ain't going to do it up front because they don't want nobody to see how, what their tactics are, what their techniques are. And if I would have stood up to this police officer, I mean, he would have kept going. And I was 35 years old. I've been through some stuff in my life. You know, I'm a Vietnam era veteran, even though I wasn't in Vietnam, but I was around a lot of people It was. All this stuff, this detective's trying to intimidate me. Well, I'm a little bit more of a hard sell case, but what about a 17, 18, 19, 20-year-old kid? What about somebody with mental issues? Somebody said, well, if you just sign this, you can go home now. Aren't you getting hungry after 16 hours? Don't you want something to drink? Sign this, you can go home. And people wonder, well, who would sign a confession or something they didn't do? Trust me, they do it all the time. All the time. And some of you are going to represent clients that did it, and you're going to say, what the heck were you thinking? And you're going to realize they're just not, these are, these are, these are prey, these are easy marks for a police officers. or something. Hopefully they get it right. They get the right person, but unfortunately and shamefully, again, is what I learned about the Sometimes because it's a front page news and because they, they ain't got a good suspect, maybe it's dragging out, they find one of the misanthropes in the neighborhood, one of their problem children, one of the people that are always in there, they find one of them and just arrest them for the murder, and now they're done with it. And that's what scares me the most. It ain't the fact that, you know, like a, a beautiful detective story where, or, or a police drama on TV where they, they go all down all the little alleyways and hit all the dead ends, and, you know, but finally they piece together the evidence and get to track, and finally they find the right person, and we're saved again, justice is done, everything's fine. Well, unfortunately, a lot of them ain't that smart. A lot of them ain't got that time. They arrest first and build a case later. If you're a defense attorney, you're going to have to tear that apart. Now, if you're a prosecutor, you're going to have to make them go out there and get the evidence, the proof to convince you that this person really did do it. I don't care which ones you are, but whichever ones you do, recognize your position, your point of, in the justice system, and do it well. And don't do it just for when. You do it for all the rest of the people that are out here. You do it for if you were sitting in that defendant's seat, how you would feel. Because, again, even if this person is guilty, if you do give them a fair trial, and always, you know, we want people punished. I'm sitting around here, I'm sitting there with people that, you know, were, were breaking car windows and stealing people's stereos and stuff, and I want to break their head. I mean, really, and I, I'm in there for murder for somebody I didn't do, and this kid's whining because he might get three months because he busted into 30-some cars in a, in a three-block radius. I'm thinking, you're lucky you didn't come to my house. I'd have sicked a dog on you, probably sent a shot flying your way, and you want to whine. You know, I mean, that's the way it was back then. But now think about this. This person is, is guilty of what he'd done. But he is treated fairly. He is treated decently. He's not abused. I mean, it's not like overly, you know, uh, uh, outrageous uh, sins. Or it's not, you know, under, uh, under weak, you know, easy, you know, slap in the hand, walk away. It's basically fair. You're teaching them a lesson from then on. It's a, that's a reason to respect the law, to have faith in the law. If you make it too hard on him, if you're a you as a defense attorney ignore him, you know, don't, don't talk to him, don't, don't really act like you're helping him, act like you care, what kind of person are you putting back on the street one day? You're putting a person out there that doesn't respect the law, doesn't care about the law, and knows it's just going to take advantage of me if I don't take advantage of it first. There's so many things I never thought about, never concerned about, never considered that goes on with our just system. You know, it's like cancer. If you want to heal cancer, we're learning now to avoid cigarettes, to avoid this, avoid that, so you don't have to treat it later on. We don't do that in the just system. We let them do whatever they want until we, find we have a reason to arrest them. Then we put them in jail. That's the treatment. There's so many things right now, being poor, being undereducated, being hungry, coming from broken families, no fatherly figure. Right away, you can, there's predictors already determined who's going to end up in prison because they don't have nothing to fear anymore. You beat your home dog enough times, and it's, I don't care how nice a dog it was to begin with, if you beat him enough times, that beating don't hurt anymore, and he don't care if he runs away for five hours and when you finally catch him, you beat him. He don't care, he'll do it again. We're doing that to our own people. We're doing that to our, to our, our children growing up right now. You know, my generation ain't going to change. I really feel most of them, you know, the majority of them are still stuck in their ways. They're going to have the, the opinion like I had before I went to reference. Oh, it's, it's right. You know, our justice system works. Trust the police and prosecution. They're here to protect us. But you're the future. 
You're the generation that always looks, you know, the younger, younger generation looks to the older generation for their mistakes, their faults, and corrects them. You younger ones are going to grow up and someday be in positions of changing the laws, making a difference. In the meantime, I'm going to try to do what I can with the rest of the people my age and around there, but uh, we have to change things, folks. We have to make a difference. I mean, this is American. Your voice and vote and voice does count. Yes, well, I think we've got time for one more. What particular, during your second trial, what particularly do you think I mean, went wrong and caused the jury to be <clears throat> again? That's a good, that's a really good question. Again, you, you have time to analyze things when you're sitting in prison walls for 20, well, actually it was out of 48 hours I was in, in, in that cell on death row. I think there's a lot of things. I think one thing is, first off, as most of you know, there's a death penalty case has what you call death qualified jury. That means that for you as a potential juror, it's a question about your belief in the death penalty. Can you support the death penalty? If you say no, you're removed. So now you got all the people that are on the jury pool, first off, are pro-death penalty, usually pretty adamantly pro-death penalty, which usually pretty much means they're pro-police, pro-prosecution. So right away, you as a defendant sitting over there in that corner already a disadvantage because they're thinking in their head, well, he must have done something or he wouldn't have been arrested. That's already a disadvantage. Secondly, it had to come out during that second trial that I was already convicted of this, this case. Because they'd say, well, didn't you say this in the other trial? Didn't you say? So some of the people had I already have it in their head that this was you know, already previous conviction. I think those two things right there put a heavy burden on defense and make it easier on the prosecution because he don't have to prove reasonable doubt now. It already seems reasonable that the guy probably did it. And lastly, which I hate to go there, but it's one of the probably the most powerful things are my jury was picked from Mesa, Arizona. Most of you probably ain't familiar with Mesa, Arizona, but how many ever heard of the Mormons? Mesa, Arizona is a Mormon enclave. It was a Mormon settlement, so it's probably about 80% Mormons. Nine of the 12 jurors on my jury were Mormons. That bite mark expert that I told you testified against me was an elder in the Mormon church. They're pretty much cultish, so think about who they're going to believe. Well, we had three of the top experts in the U.S. bite mark experts saying, no way can it possibly be me. And this one man says it is me, and he's an elder in the Mormon church. Of course, I don't want to go up against the Mormon church. They got a lot of money, and uh, know in history, they've been known to wipe out small settlements just to take over the land. So I only got a 27-acre farm. I don't want to come and take my farm from it. But uh, no, it's a good question. I don't know. And, and looking back, I mean, what are your attorney? You as an attorney, you, sometimes you never know what happens. But you, some of them contacted me. Some of them did feel bad about it. Um, well, I say, I mean, that's something they got to live with. But uh, you know, most of them said, well, we just, we just believed the, the bite mark evidence. And actually, we found out the second trial, because the jury, as I said, was out for three and a half days, and we're, we're actually, half of them were in tears. Uh, they said it, you know, because the DNA was too confusing, they said. So they said they ended up taking the picture of where, the, where this, this bite mark, and it, don't imagine a whole full set of teeth or anything. There was like three marks on the top and like two or three marks on the bottom, and you know, that, that were actually, you could see was individualized, and then there was some bruising around that. Uh, it wasn't a full bite mark, you know. But they said they actually sat in the jury room and then voted tooth by tooth, does this look like it matches? And they said yes. They went to the next one, and that's what they convicted them on. They ignored the hairs. They ignored everything else. They said it was too confusing. They went on the bite mark, individually did their own expert, you know, analyzing of, of this and decided yes. Uh, and that's why they said they voted to uh, guilt. So what do you do? Yes, one more. So you were the 100th person exonerated due to DNA, right? No, I was just 100th person exonerated. It was yeah. on death row. Not, death DNA, row. not DNA. Okay, so what's the number now? It's about 121 or 122 folks. In the last three years, there's been 20 some more. That's just death row convictions. Now, you mentioned the race factor. I'm wondering uh, what the stats are on the exoneration rate. I don't have that stat exactly. I think it's about 50 50 race wise who's getting freed, who isn't. Uh, I'm not sure that anybody's done that. Anybody has got that need information, really, I don't know if you ever heard of the. DPIC, Death Penalty Information Center out of Washington, D.C. They're pretty much supposed to be an unbiased center, but it just keeps stats, just keeps polls, keeps record. Anything you ever, ever wanted to know about the death penalty from what state has it, what state doesn't have it, who's executed, any of that stuff, you can find on, on DPIC's website. So if you haven't already got that information, it's one place. They were just not able to compel them to consider DNA. Do you know which one that was? There's one recently in Virginia that they executed a guy and now they got DNA that they want to get tested and the Attorney General is withholding that, won't allow them to test it because they keep saying another one. I debate DAs all the time, well not all the time, but a few times. And that can be fun at times even with no law degree going up against them. 
But uh, no, they, they, the, the Attorney General in, in, does not want to release the evidence that, that they had because it looks like it's going to completely exonerate him and prove now that they executed an innocent person. And that's one of the things that, are, that the proponents of the death penalty say is that our system works. Look, he's, he's been released. He's free. His system worked. It proved him innocent. And show us an, in, an innocent person that was executed. Well, how do you prove a, you know, a negative like that? I mean, they destroy the evidence right away when, when somebody's free or executed, everything's destroyed. How do you go back and prove it? And even if somebody confesses to it afterwards, they say, oh, you can't believe that guy. He's a convicted criminal. But here's an here's example. It's like, what do you got to hide? If you won't give up that DNA, why are you hiding it? There's just recently also a case in either Kansas or Missouri where another uh, execution happened, and a, a DA out there has actually reopened the case because a man found out about who was executed when it was a friend of his. He was one of the eyewitnesses that had seen it at the time. There was, there was a drive-by shooting. He had seen the shooting. He was actually wounded in the shooting. Finds out years later in some school group, somebody had tracked him down and said, we know so-and-so was executed for that. He's like, what? That was my friend. I, it wasn't him. I'd I seen the guy. It wasn't him. Anyway, a, a DA now in, in either Missouri or Kansas is reopening that case and going back and investigating. Hopefully she's going to do a legitimate job of it and, and it's for the purpose of finding out the truth, not just to get her name in the papers and come back later on and say, oh no, it's the right person. We don't know yet what's going to come out of that. But here is the actual DNA, DA that took the step to, to reopen a case that somebody's already been executed for. Interesting. So I know it's getting late for y'all. I believe we had to get out of here. Thank you all for coming. I think there's some, is there some other events or anything that you just had announcements for them? And don't be afraid.